Hello everybody. Um, haven't been making a lot of videos lately. It has been uncommonly busy at work. I don't know what's going on, if there's something in the air or something, but we've been getting a lot of service calls and all the guys have been really running hard. So I guess that's a good thing um, that we're working. But anyways, uh, had a little bit of time today. I thought I'd relax and come down and play on a bench a little bit give you guys a little update and do a short video for you. Um, first I want to start out by saying that uh, finally our single-ended guitar amplifier project uh, I've received my transformer. So there's our single-ended transformer. We'll talk more about that um, when we get back to that project but for the moment uh, I have some other things that I'm working on currently and I wanted to go over with you all. Now, let me give you my disclaimer. First of all, I am not by any means a, uh, you know, a high-end design engineer when it comes to vacuum tube circuitry. So uh, take what I'm going to show you here with a grain of salt. I'm just sh sharing some of my experience with you and what has worked for me in the past and uh, just giving you maybe, a, especially you who are just getting into this, giving you a little bit of a springboard to jump off of to get started. So what I have here <clears throat> is a little drawing. I think I said on the earlier videos that I was going to show you a simple circuit that we can use to boost, you know, for all vacuum tube, that we can use to boost our little MP3 player, or, you know, if you want to use your phone or whatever, um, to boost it up to line level so that you get a little higher output. A lot of these um, MP3 devices, uh, especially the ones, uh, let me show you one here if I got one. You can go on eBay and you can buy these little modules. And you plug in a, you know, a thumb drive or a SD card and hook it up to a power source and uh, make yourself a cheap, inexpensive little MP3 player. Uh, they work really well, actually. They sound pretty good for what they are and for how cheap they are. But the output just isn't enough to drive a tube circuit. Um, it just isn't. Uh, it, you know, there's a whole myriad of reasons, you know, voltage, current, all these things. But the bottom line is it's not enough to drive your amp to full power in most cases. Um, now, some preamps are a little more sensitive than others. Um, I think I showed you that I was able to use the preamp out of one of my Pioneer integrated amplifiers to drive my tube amp to full power, but that had a lot more output. Uh, that boosted the output considerably from what uh, the MP3 player can put out just by itself. So what if we don't want to use a preamp? What if we want to just use our little inter our little power amp? project that we designed and built. Uh, this is kind of my solution to it. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I work with this. It's a very simple design. As you can see, three resistors, two capacitors, and actually, let me freehand draw one more. So we come out here. and that goes into your next stage, okay? So that'll be your anode capacitor, CA. Okay, and we'll just, we'll just, uh, CG and CA, there we go. All right, so really, two, three capacitors, three resistors, couldn't be simpler. And what this is, is a half of a standard triode tube. Now, in case some of you aren't familiar with this, there's a whole bunch of these little tubes that are out there on the market. And as you can see, they have three, or they have uh, two elements in them. There are two, there's actually two tubes in one. So really, we have enough to do a stereo with one tube. So we can have one tube that can take care of this whole thing for us. And if you look here, I wrote down some names of some of the common ones that are all similar. All right, so our first and most popular one by far is going to be the 12AX7. 
Okay, that's this tube here. And you can see they don't look much different than one another. They're all very similar. But we'll get into the differences here in a second. So we have the 12AX7. We have a 12AU7, which I don't have one of these out, but it looks just like the 12AX7. You can't tell them apart just by looking at the plates. Uh, there's some less common ones, like the 12AZ7, the 12AY7. Okay, maybe you can see that. And even the 12AT7. Okay, now what's the difference? Well, if we just physically look at them, we can see that they do have uh, different sized plates, but that doesn't necessarily tell you everything. Just because the plate is larger physically doesn't always mean that the gain of the tube is, is, is higher or lower. But what it can tell us is, you know, some tubes can handle a little bit more power than other. but none of these are really designed to be power tubes. They're all low. I mean, none of these can go more than, you know, a fraction of a watt or one watt maximum, some of them or so. Not very much power. They're really not designed for power. They're designed to amplify the gain of a signal. Okay, so you're just adding gain. You're amplifying the signal. Um, you're not amplifying the power. You're just amplifying the voltage level. Okay, there's a big difference between that. And uh, I think that's where some people get confused. All we want to do is increase the voltage so that the signal voltage coming out of here is a magnitude of times larger than the, the voltage level going in here. Okay, so if this were a 10 to 1 gain, that means if I put 1 volt peak to peak AC sine wave in here, I would get 10 volts peak to peak AC sine wave right here. Okay, that's a gain of 10. All right. Now, the design of these tubes can vary the amount of gain that this circuit will produce with these resistors. Okay, and I didn't want to get into a whole ton of complicated theory on this, but basically what we're doing, this is a class A amplifier which means that we're, we're floating this, this grid here above ground. It's, we're making it, what are we saying? We're making this more negative, okay? By, by floating the cathode above ground, okay, I'm sorry I said I floated the grid, floating the cathode above ground, we bring this to a negative voltage with respect to this, okay? So what's going to happen is, we're going to set this thing somewhere near the middle of its operating point. So, in other words, if the voltage, and we're not even going to talk about volts yet, if you have this much swing here, okay, in other words, you have, when this thing's fully turned on, my voltage is up here. When this thing's fully turned off, my voltage is down here. I want this grid in such a way that I'm right in here when it's sitting idle. That way if I go my, my positive swing of my sine wave I get the full amount and when I go to my negative swing of my sine wave I get the full amount. If I bias this different than that, let's say we move this down here, what's going to happen is I'm not going to have a problem here. It's going to still swing its amount of gain that, that the circuit's designed for. But when it gets down here, it wants to go more. It can't because you hit the floor. There's no more. I'm not trying to rhyme on purpose, but hey. So what will happen is it'll just clip off. It'll just stop there. And then when this theoretical part swings back up, it'll pick back up where it's left off and come back. So what you end up having is what's called clipping. So you'll have a flat spot and then back up instead of a nice sine wave, okay? So the idea is in any of these circuits to adjust this so that it swings within the maximum 
and minimum voltages that this circuit can operate. And that's what this divider circuit does, okay? By adjusting these two resistors, we can adjust that operating point to be right in the middle, okay? Now, we can get away with not being so perfect with that. <laughs> How can we do that? Well, here's the thing. Let's say we don't need the full swing Okay, so if I have from here to here, let's say I only need to amplify the signal this much. Okay, like that. So I'm not even getting to the outside the zone of this tube where it'll work, the operating points of the tube. So if I have this biased a little bit higher, as long as this top part doesn't clip here, if I would bias it a little lower, this bottom part doesn't clip here, no harm, no foul still works. But if I want to set the gain of this to the very maximum this tube can do, then we have to adjust these two resistors until the operating point is right in the middle. And there are math formulas for this. And I've tried to calculate these things perfectly and everything in the past. And not being such a good experienced design engineer with this, I have mixed results with my uh, calculations. So what I found is that, as a general rule of thumb, if you're putting 250 volts up here, okay, this will be about a 100K resistor, and the cathode resistor, the anode resistor will be 100K, cathode will be somewhere in the line of about 1.8K, all right, for up here, 1.8. And that's going to make for a 12AX7, that is. And that's going to make this thing float somewhere in the middle of its operating point. Um, and in theory, the gain of a 12AX7 is around 100. So, in a perfect world, whatever comes into this grid will be amplified 100 times coming out of here. Now, in the real world, we don't usually get that high of a result, okay? All tubes are a little bit different, first of all. Every 12AX7, if you put a hundred of them lined up, all hundred of them will have little slight differences. Some of them will have big differences. But as a rule of thumb, the spec sheets for 12AX7, gain is 100. 12AU7, I mean, gain on those can be somewhere in the line of their low gain, you know, 20 to 30, I think. I'm pulling this off top of my head, so if you look up the spec sheets, you'll see it's less than the 12AX7. And a 12AT7 might have a gain around 50 or something like that. I can't remember. But they all have different gain values. So here's where we can play games. Um, first of all, we start off with our 100K and our 1.8K, or 100K and 1K, or 100K and 4.7K will give you lower gain for your 12AX7, okay? Again, as you, by adjusting this, you're adjusting that operating point and you're adjusting the gain of the circuit, okay? So, we can adjust this and we can adjust this by choosing, just by popping the 12AX7 out and popping in 12AU7 in, even though we didn't change any of these, it's not going to be totally ideal but it is going to change the gain value and reduce the gain of this circuit. Then we can use our, adjust our little resistors to bring it into where we want. What you'll find is by adjusting the tube type, and usually the only two you need, because there's such a versatile amount of adjustment in these, tubes are very forgiving. A 12AX7 and a 12AU7 can pretty much handle any range of gain values you want for this little circuit that we're going to build. Remember, all we want to do is boost this a couple of times, make it a little bit more amplified coming out of our MP3 player, all right? MP3. And this goes into the input of your amp, the preamp section. Uh, that's all you need is to boost this a little bit. If it's not enough, use a 12AX7. If it's too much, you can either increase this resistance, which can mess with your operating points now, 
or you can just pop in a 12AU7. Both of them can handle similar voltages. Um, again, don't get crazy. These things can operate on a very wide range of voltages, anywhere from 100, 150 volts, all the way up to 250, sometimes even 300 if you increase your resistors enough. All right, But most driver circuits like this, preamps like this, these little preamp circuits, usually you're going to find they're going to run on a range of 180 to 250 volts, typically. And again, the, the voltage isn't super critical as long as it stays stable. Again, the biggest thing on all this is stability. We Once something's set, you don't want it to move. So your B+, plus, you don't want any ripple on it, and you don't want it to drift up and down. You want it to stay fairly stable. If you remember on the preamp section of our scratch-built stereo amp, we actually put a solid-state uh, high-voltage regulator circuit in there by using a transistor out of a horizontal output of a TV. And we did that to keep this voltage very constant so it didn't move around. But anyways, now, so that's pretty much it. Now, th what's this here? This is a bypass capacitor, and what this does, it's optional, okay? So this is optional. If you put it in, it's going to increase the output of this. In other words, what's going to happen is, at DC, this is going to open up. It's going to look like an open circuit. It's not going to influence when it's sitting idle with DC. As soon as you start passing AC through it, especially the lower notes and so forth, this acts as a short and starts to bypass this resistor. By bypassing this resistor, we're increasing the gain of the circuit because the lower this resistance, the higher the gain here. The higher this resistance, the lower the gain. Okay, so by doing that, putting this in there, it's giving you kind of the best of both worlds. Now, that being said, if the output of this is too harsh and it's overdriving the input of your amp, another option is removing this and just using the resistor by itself. You'll see that the, the output of this is going to tame down a little bit and it's not going to be as harsh driving into your amp. Okay? These are all little tricks. Little tiny adjustments uh, can really dial this into your personal need. And, and like I said, experiment with this because different amps, different inputs, and different MP3 players will require a different gain. All right. So the next thing we want to go to over here is this grid resistor. A lot of people call it a grid leak resistor, but I've kind of heard that that's not really exactly what it is. But that's what they call it, the grid leak resistor. This needs more than infinite impedance between ground and the grid for it to operate. Now, of course, this is a very sensitive signal, so the, the lower the resistance you put to ground, the, you know, the more you're going to shunt out the action of this grid. But in the same token, you need something just to allow a few electrons to float, to just to keep that little bit of charge on this grid. So typically you'll see this to be a 1 mega ohm resistor, a, mil a 1 million ohm resistor. That works 99% of the time. But just understand, you can change it a little bit. Um, if this thing isn't behaving itself, if it's unstable, uh, Sometimes just changing this resistor down or up a wee little bit, going to a 470K or a 1.5 meg or so forth, can make, can make it more stable. But start out with 1 meg. Okay, that's a good starting point, and usually you're going to find out that's all you need. Last but not least, we have our decoupling capacitors. You have to have these. Now, they're not so important here, although I like to have them because, again, if the, if the output impedance of your MP3 player for some reason is very low, let's say it's only maybe 200 ohms or something, you know, or 300 ohms, that's going to really clamp this down hard, and that's not good for the tube. It's not going to like that. So by 
putting this cap in here, you're pretty much decoupling the influence, the DC influence component of your device. Okay, so that's why I like this. You'll see some people don't do that. They just have a resistor here, and the resistor just kind of keeps, makes sure this can't be clamped too far. I don't like it that as much. I like the capacitor. But again, it'll work with the resistor. And if you do put a resistor in there, it's probably going to be somewhere 68K, 47K, 100K, something like that. All right, now, what value? If you look in my notes here, it can be anywhere from 0 0.001 microfarad up to 0.47 microfarad, okay? How do you know what you need to be? Well, I found that, once again, the best thing to do with both of these is experiment. If you start getting oscillation in this tube, or if the speaker starts to flutter during, you know, during bass notes, it's in other words, it's not a real tight sounding bass, uh, chances are you have too much voltage getting through this, so you have too, too high of a capacitance, you need to drop the capacitance. Conversely, if the output seems choked off a little bit, or it's, the sound is tinny, it doesn't have very much bass response, you may have too low of a capacitance in here, okay? Um, in most cases, like, your input here could be like a point oh one, point oh two, something like that, and your output here is probably going to be a point oh four seven, or a point oh one, or a point, uh, point one, something like that, okay? But it can be, and again, these are very forgiving. Uh, you can adjust these numbers quite a bit and not really too terribly influence uh, the performance of your amp, okay? So this, I know this was just kind of a short little synopsis on how this works, but really guys, this is, this is all there is to it. Uh, one, two, three resistors, one, two, three capacitors, okay? The other thing is this, this cap right here, if you do use the bypass cap, it is an electrolytic, and it doesn't have to be, but for this high of, high of uh, capacitance, you're going to want an electrolytic, and it is polarized, so make sure the negative goes on ground, positive goes up on a cathode end. Uh, I choose 63 volts. There is usually nowhere near 63 volts here, but by using a 63 volt capacitor, 63 volt capacitors have relatively low ESR, all right, when compared to a 15 or 25 volt capacitor. So I just do that for, number one, for added protection of the higher voltage, but also for the lower ESR. It'll just make it, it'll just make it function a little bit cleaner, a little bit better. Now I've built up this circuit, and uh, I've actually installed it into that amp. And we're going to see that in another video, uh, how I have this in here. It works really, really well. What I'm running into is the amp is still unstable. It will oscillate and it is very unhappy with the feedback circuit. And we're really going to have to zero in on that feedback circuit, how the negative feedback from the output transformer works. That output transformer has, that I chose has, cho has turned out to be quite a challenge for me to get all the values of components set properly. So we'll talk about that theory a little bit more in another video, but I just kind of wanted to show you this video for right now so that maybe you can put something like this together and experiment with it. Um, I've seen this same circuit with just uh, even battery voltages up here by lowering some of these resistances and using, you know, a 9 volt battery even. Uh, it doesn't work real well, but it does work. Um, but again, experiment. Doesn't cost any, you know, one of these tubes you can buy a Chinese one very inexpensively in a socket. And, you know, you're talking a small handful of, you know, a couple dollars of components. So you could be off to the races very inexpensively. And uh, you'll be surprised how clean and how nice these tubes really and how warm of a sound you get. Last but not least, any of these 12A style tubes have a uh, split filament. And this is really nice because if you notice, there's a center tap on your filament. Now, 
the standard filament from pin 4 to pin 5 from here to here is a 12 volt filament but if you tie 4 and 5 together and then pin 9 and go to pin 9 it's a 6.3 volt filament so you can run this it, it'll be more higher current but half the voltage so you can set you can run this on a 12 volt or a 6 volt filament circuit and it'll work just fine as long as you wire it properly okay so just another thing uh, if you do decide to do this I highly recommend going online and downloading uh, the data sheet for a 12AX7 and a 12AU7 and you'll see some of the things that I'm talking about okay so again I didn't get into any uh, emissions charts or anything like that I just wanted to from an experimenter standpoint I just wanted to show you how you could put this together and get a functioning circuit very easily with a couple of components um, again if you like this video give me a thumbs up and uh, the next thing we're going to look at is going to be the stereo amp once again coming back to haunt us uh, with our with its new addition fitted onto it and maybe I'll share with you some of the nightmares that I'm going through with the uh, feedback circuit which has really given me a challenge but again the purpose that I built this amp in the first place was to learn some things and to try some new things that I haven't done before in the past so it's it's actually really been quite fun to do and I'm hoping that uh, if we keep plugging along we'll have just what what it is we set out to achieve all right, that's it for right now. Got to get back to work and everything, but I uh, just thought I'd share that with y'all, and more to come.